Hey guys, very excited to have this guest on here today. His name is Adam Carolla. Crazy to think that I've uh, grown up watching Adam on The Man Show. I'm sure a lot of the male listeners might be resonating with this. And uh, very excited to have him on. Adam is quite a versatile talent. Of course, he does stand-up comedy. He is a daily podcaster. He's a New York Times bestselling author. And his new book, I'm Your Emotional Support Animal, which is his fifth book, is out now. And uh, part of the reason why he's coming on here to talk with us on the show. And yeah, he is uh, someone that is an OG in the podcast world. So for me to be able to speak with him right now and to be able to pick his brain is uh, is, is quite a quite an honor. So folks, very excited to have him on here and I uh, look forward to hearing your feedback on this. Enjoy. Boom. Adam Carolla, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Well, um, I am so curious to start off by just the amazement of all the things that you've got going on. You're a stand-up comedian. You're podcasting every day. I think you've got like three or four different podcasts that are going. You're starring in movies. And of course, you've got your fifth book out now, which is I'm Your Emotional Support Animal. How do you do all this? Like, It's crazy to think you're doing all these things at the same time. Um, you get good people around you and then you, you delegate a lot of stuff and the, the stuff you really need to do, you do that stuff and the other stuff you just check in on f frequently. You just, you're constantly checking in on a documentary or, uh, or, you know, I, I do a lot of building projects and things like that. So it's like you, you become kind of like a foreman on a construction site you have all the different subs you got the drywallers and the hvac guys and the framers and you just you you just go check with them like all the time tell them what you want and then go on to the next trade building projects like you're you're doing like real estate projects where you're constructing buildings you're saying i'm always working on something i'm always uh rebuilding a car or rebuilding a house or some some version of that gotcha just to keep your mind of peace it's just what i do i i don't know how else to uh, describe it yeah yeah well the thing is about the industry you're in as someone that is a personal brand maybe that sounds icky to you but is someone that has their business centered around your name, your personality, your your comedy, and your words, it's not the same as like a business, right? I run a business where I can delegate and hire people, but my name is not on it, and it's a bit less attached. So was that hard for you? How did you manage being able to delegate to other people when everything is around you? Well, you know, you, you really need the right people and and once you have the right people and once you kind of speak their language and they understand what what your language is then it becomes pretty simple you know i make documentaries i've made i don't know five or six documentaries as well i don't sit in the edit bay i don't interview every every person that's going to be on that or in that documentary um but what I do do is go pop my head in the edit bay, ask them, show me what you got, any questions or, you know, uh, show me a rough cut. Let me give you notes on this rough cut, you know, and it, it's like, you know, the work. I don't really have a work day. I'll take a rough cut home on the weekend and I'll just sit there Saturday night with my notepad and I'll just make notes and Monday morning, I'll just hand the notes off back to the guys I make the film with and I'll see another rough cut in a week, you know? So it's kind of, 
I'm not physically in the edit bay. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing the color correction. I'm not mixing the sound. I'm just looking at everything all, all along the way. Right. Right. And same with your book. I imagine it's, you have someone that can help you. You obviously have an editor, you have a publisher, you've got someone that's uh, helping you write the book. I'm curious to like, what's the incentive for you now? This is your fifth book. I'm your emotional support animal because I liken the book writing process. I have a few friends of mine that I've written books and it's kind of like cooking a Thanksgiving feast where it takes so much effort to prepare it, to perfect it. And then by the time you're done, most people don't even finish it. You know, of course I finished your book and it's an easy to read. Whereas like a podcast is more like, like a fast food. You can just eat it every day and you, you don't really have to think about it so much. What's the incentive for you to now be writing books of, of your fifth book now? Well, thanks for finishing my book. Uh, number one. <laughs> yeah. Most people don't finish books, right? No, 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 no. Uh, so number one, thank you for that. Number two, um, yeah, I always give this answer. Uh, I never in my wildest dreams thought I was going to write a book. Um, I was fairly illiterate or mostly illiterate my entire life. I was a very poor student. I didn't go to college. Um, there's no good reason why I should write a book. But somebody came to me and offered me money to write a book. So I said, okay, I shall, I shall write this book. And that's basically how it's one times five books. Somebody comes to me and says, I'm going to offer you money. Can you write a book? And I think most, <clears throat> most authors don't speak that way. They go, I had the inspiration or I was motivated or I saw this injustice and I couldn't turn a blind eye to it. No, somebody, somebody cut me a check and I, and I wrote a book and I think, I think the prop, I think the reason why no author says that, and they always talk about they were inspired by X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and I'm, I'm sure 85% of the time it's just untrue. You know, you, the people give you money, you write a book. Now I think they think it's somehow then the book is going to be disingenuous or you didn't really mean it. Or, you know, somehow you're just going to mail it in and, and get the money. Um, that's not how it works. You know, I, I travel the country. I do stand up. I do stand up because they pay me to fly to Florida and do a show. But I don't go up on stage and just stand there. I work my ass off because I want that audience to be entertained. Now, I'm only there because somebody offered me money, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to kick ass when I'm on stage. And, you know, that was the same when I was a carpenter. People offer me money to build them an entertainment unit. So I would build them a good entertainment unit. Like that's how that's how the world works. Uh, for some reason, yeah. when it becomes the creative process, especially literary stuff, People get kind of pious about it, but it's it's really no different than being a carpenter, a drywaller, any, any other job, a school teacher. You know, you get paid to go in there and teach, but it doesn't mean you don't want to be a great school teacher. Although yeah, there are not, not too many of them, but go ahead. And did you narrate your own audiobook as well? Because I, I read it, of course. You did, because that's a grueling process, right? I mean, it's just it's just insane, like the amount of time that it takes and the energy that it takes just to sit there or stand there and just narrow your whole book the whole time how long did it take you well that's a that's a good question and um i don't know is the answer because uh but it's it, anyone listening this is a great sort of metaphor for for life um i am a i i'm not a good reader and I'm not a good uh, out loud reader. I'm, I am, I really did not get educated when I was younger. And um, I was reading out loud would have, would, would be right up there 
you know, with sharks and snakes for me in terms of like phobias and, and, and rightfully so I was that bad at it, but I'd improved over the years. And what I did with this book, and again, the notion of reading 250 pages out loud to me, I, I would rather do a tough mutter on a, you know, 110 degree day than, than that. But what I did is I said, we, we will record it in my studio. So where I sit with this microphone and I will come in an hour early, three days a week before the podcast. And we'll, we will just lay down as many pages as we can do in an hour. And then we'll come in on Saturday and we'll do a two hour session and whatever I get done in that two hour session, that's what I'll get done. So that's the way I did it. And, you know, two and a half weeks into that process, it was like, oh, we've covered 150 pages. We covered 150 pages, like 11 pages at a time, you know, and it became much more palatable that way. Sure, sure. And I imagine you got into the habit of just being able to do that by in a bite chunk way every 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 time you did your podcast it, it's yeah it's daunting when you block off a six hour period to do an audiobook but where you just do it an hour at a time you just fly through it it doesn't feel sure. like it doesn't feel like anything yeah yeah and i know like academics and, and and focusing on that wasn't like a big thing but i've read based on your book that football was a potentially serious career path for you is that is that true? And what was the thing that stopped you from pursuing that? Yeah, I wouldn't call it a serious career path, but it, it did save my life. I, I do feel in, in many ways um, because of the kind of childhood I had. And I, I learned, you know, discipline and focus and hard work and sort of teamwork and, and all that stuff from it. So it, it, it really made a big impact in my life. Now, as far as career path, I was, I was kind of a standout in high school. I got some offers and some scholarship offers for some eight or eight or 10 medium to small size schools that weren't, you know, football powerhouses. And why were you the standout? Was it, uh, was it like your size? Was it your speed? No, I I really just made a commitment to it and just kind of outworked everybody. I, I just kind of lived in the weight room and ate, I don't know, six hard boiled eggs every day for lunch, you yeah. know, and wow. and I just kind of I just kind of willed it, you know, but I didn't have the speed. I didn't have the size. There was no. There's no real next level for me except for maybe getting a a free ride and education at one of these medium to small size schools that I never I never capitalized on. Right, right. Do you ever wonder if you did take that path where you would be today? Do you think you'll still be in the media industry and, and doing what you're doing now? Well, yeah. I I, I could have went to Cal Poly Pomona or UC Davis and got a engineering degree or something and played football <laughs> and and uh, although I probably I was such a poor student I don't even know if that 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 would have worked but I, I could have gone to college for free for a year or two maybe yeah and you don't think you would have stayed I I was such a poor student that I just can't imagine walking out of there in four years <laughs> with a degree. <laughs> I don't know, like these college colleges in the U.S., they will do anything to keep a good football player, you know, like they're it's really about athletics before academics, clearly in the U.S. Well, I, w I was good in high school. I don't know. One, once I got to the college level, I do not know if I would be considered good. Sure, sure. But that's it's it's pretty uh, admirable to say based on, you know, just your willingness to be able to like fort yourself just because of the childhood that you had. I imagine it was, it was so tough. So this was, was this more of like a survival thing for you? Like you're basically burning all the boats and this was your way out. For me, 
there was really only one thing I was good at, and that was football. And and mm. that's the only thing I was good at. I couldn't. I, I was a bad student. My my home life was was not good. It was chaotic and. I didn't have a girlfriend, you know, I really, all I kind of had was, was football. So for me, it was very important to, to hang on to that. Right. Right. And I imagine you had a sense of humor based on what you were saying. So you had something there that inclined you to pursue something in the comedy world eventually. Yeah. Eventually. Yeah. I, yeah, I always had a sense of humor and, and I was good at football and that, that was about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I found interesting in your book is you, you were talking about this is your previous book, I think, where you're, where you're saying that, I, that you always look at your life as a young person, that you're always uncomfortable. You didn't have air conditioning and you had to drive like a broken down pickup truck. And then you see the kids growing up today. You see a lot of young guys and they're completely comfortable. And, you know, if you're comfortable, how are you going to manage to be able to crawl out out of that apartment? And uh and dig a footing, as you mentioned, it's uh, it's it's quite a contrast to where you grew up with today. Yeah, the my discomfort was a great motivator for me, and I think it's a great motivator for everybody. You know, where you know the reason everything was invented pretty much is because someone was uncomfortable and wanted it faster, better, more comfortable, safer, whatever way of doing it. So. If I had had the kind of comfort that my kids have that currently enjoy, I don't know if I would have had that kind of fire in my belly. Uh, I imagine I wouldn't. I it's it's not that it doesn't, you know, it's not that it doesn't happen. I know plenty of comedians who grew up in nice homes and went to college and had had a good life, and you know, at some point the comedy just kind of bubbled to the top, but. For me, my my work ethic, I think, comes from that discomfort. Yeah. How, how do you approach parenting, just knowing how you grew up, just because you see all these like Hollywood celebrities with that are parents, and oftentimes they have spoiled kids, right? They just, they just live in a, such a fortunate place that it's hard not to be spoiled around that environment. So knowing that, how have you approached how you parent your kids? And is there any lessons that people can take away from what you've done? I don't have a real strong philosophy for parenting. You know, my kids are spoiled. Um, <laughs> they have to be. I mean, they just live in a yeah. big house with air conditioning all, all over the place. And so, sure. I, you know, I get it. They're spoiled. That's fine. Um you know, my thing is just be consistent, uh, be a good person and essentially try to lead by example. You know, I, I tell them all the time I'm getting up, I'm going to work or I can't do this thing. I have to be at work. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I have to go fly and I have to go to this place and I'm doing it to earn money so we can have this lifestyle. So I, I, I don't, I don't do a lot of preaching and I don't do a lot of, you know, father knows best. I just do a lot of like, here's how I'm, I live my life. I am a, I live in this big house too, but every morning during the winter, I walk out of it and I go into a swimming pool that's freezing cold and I swim to one side and back to the other underwater huh. in a freezing cold pool because I don't want to get soft in this world we're living in interesting is it like the wim hof method that you do or is it just you don't really have a philosophy or, or practice around that i don't do the wim hof method although i should i just walk out of my back door and just walk into that pool and just <laughs> yep. and, and and i live in the foothills and it'll get into the 30s at night you know during the winter and the the pool gets pretty damn cold and um, I'll just swim across one way and then I'll go under, touch the drain, swim under uh, back and then I'll get out yeah. and I'll be beat red and there'll be steam coming off me. 
and uh, <laughs> and I'll just do it every morning. Yeah, you don't drag your kids into it either. I tried. Uh, my daughter won't go near it. My wife won't go near it, and my son. I did a deal with him last year, which is um, every time I go out and do stand up for free, you need to get into the pool. Um, mm. Now, not a stand up gig and not a corporate gig and not being paid. But if I if I get up, if I go out on a Thursday night and drive across town to go to the Laugh Factory and do 20 minutes for free. Then the next morning, you got to get in the pool. <laughs> How's that going? Uh, not well. Yeah, you're like, you're like, I don't do this. I don't do this for free, right? <laughs> worked. Uh, it worked. Uh, it, it worked for about four months, I'd say, and then he kind of got out of it. Uh, okay, gotcha. I mean, you seem like the chillest parent. I'm not gonna lie. I can't ever imagine you yelling at your kids or having a fit because they did something. I just. Out of all the things that I've seen you in the media, I just it just can't seem to ever think that you're not like a the chillest parent. Yeah, I mean, I just I don't care that much about a lot of stuff. Like, you know, I don't care about their grades. I don't care about school. I just I, I have no little to no faith in school. I don't even know what college is going to be like in in a few years. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really want them to go to college. Honestly, what what really? what's going on at college these days? No, yeah. I I. I, I very much believe that uh, they go to college and they get kind of indoctrinated into this weird sort of leftist world. And I, I don't even want them there. Like, I'm not Ted Nugent, but I don't want them going somewhere and learning that this country was founded in 1619, you know. So mm -hmm. the college campuses have gone like so hard left that I don't even crazy. I don't even know if I want my kids exposed to that stuff. I'd rather them just intern somewhere and get a job. Yeah, yeah. We actually had Dr. Drew on the show a couple of months ago and asked him the similar question, which is like, colleges are going to shit and it's going to change completely. All the materials that you're learning today, unless you're like in science, technology or, you know, the STEM fields, they're pretty much all outdated. And as you mentioned, it's just politically leaning one way. So it's very confusing for a parent to be able to decide whether they should go to school or not. So the question is like, what's the alternative if your kids are growing up and they can't go to a college? I all most of the successful people I know never finish college. So for me, yeah. you, you know, you're asking the wrong guy. I never went to college and I'm successful. So mm -hmm. my feeling is, is figure out what you want to do and do it. Now, look, if you want to be an ophthalmologist, well, then you got to go to college if yeah. that's what you want to do. But if, right. if, if not, you want to work in media or you just whatever you have, you want to be an entrepreneur, whatever, whatever that thing is, don't bother. Go intern somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of good, um, I guess, initiatives coming out. I don't know if you've heard of this thing called Mission U. And it's a school where they focus on like a lot of the science technology fields. And what they would do is you, it's free to go to college and they would take a portion of your salary once you're hired. If you don't get hired from a big tech company or startup, you don't get any fees at all. So it's this new and more innovative format that's starting to come out a little bit where it's targeted for very specific fields that aren't really outdated. And uh, yeah, th those are some op opportunities out there for sure. Yeah, for me that, that you know, going somewhere, moving somewhere, living in some brick and mortar, dorm from the from the 60s and just doing general ed stuff seems like a colossal waste of time and money because your smartphone yeah. can teach you everything you want to know now if you're curious you're fine something like mission you makes a lot more sense get focused learn something you know i'm very big on having a field of expertise I, I'm very big on have a have a trade, have a craft, n have a have a specialty. You know, I'm a carpenter, and at, once you become a, a carpenter, if you're a decent carpenter, you'll never be out of work. You're not going to get rich, but you'll never be out of work ever. 
And I, I kind of learned that lesson from the the skill and the trade of of carpentry. And I like having a tangible trade. It it feels there's something secure about it. I feel like sure. I just I I'll I'll never go back to being a carpenter, but I like having a trade and a skill. And I think people would really benefit regardless of even what they were doing for a living, if they picked up a skill, like a tangible skill, I, I, I just feel like it rounds your game out uh, to a, a much greater extent. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I was reading something where I'm going to butcher the exact numbers on this, but I think it was somewhere around like by the time you are seven years old today, like the seven-year-olds that are growing up today, they'll be working in jobs that don't even exist yet. Like they haven't even been invented yet because of how fast technology and, you know, all these things are evolving. And you got to wonder like, number one, can schools teach that? And how many people are going to be out of jobs because there's going to be so many people that you need to retrain? Uh, have you had any thoughts in terms of, of something like the UBI program that a lot of people are talking about? We've had... Andrew Yang on the show as well, and he's obviously a big component of that. What are your thoughts around this idea of giving out free money to people? Well, I've talked to Andrew Yang about it as well, and I don't like the notion of it in general because I think it weakens people and it hurts people. On the other hand, and I, I, I don't like any form of handout. I just believe it destroys whatever that group is. I think we've kind of seen it we've seen it with you know you take american indians we gave them some land we gave them some stuff they're doing worse than any group ever in in this country any group you just give stuff to it just hobbles them but yeah um you know when when andrew was saying that you know big tech is making money off of you and your your information and if they're going to make money off of you know you and your information then why not you know or what so in a in a sense if it's your money then it's not really a handout you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying so whatever that amount is if we can quantify the amount that you know this company or these companies, you know, if we can assign a number to it, if, if the average numbers, you know, 866 bucks a month that all these tech companies make using your information, well then take the 866 bucks a month, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess in that case, it's a, such a small number where I mean, for some people, it's it's obviously a big deal. But living in the U.S., especially if you're in like in L.A. or, or New York, ten thousand a year is not going to do enough damage for you to be lazy and motivated. May might give people some buffer in terms of uh, you know how they're able to survive a little bit longer. Yeah, I I know it. I know the the general wisdom is this would help people you know, make their rent or make their car payment or what have you. Um, and it's hard to argue with the math. There's just a part of me that's very frightened of handing out stuff. I just, mm -hmm. I just feel I, I just by nature, it's, it's the way I kind of feel about socialism. You know, it's like, it, it's a very slippery slope don't even get near it. It's kind of the way, you know, it's kind of the way I, I look at it. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. As an immigrant and as an Asian, like that's, I feel like a lot of Asian Americans that have immigrated here probably resonate with that just because that's just a way we were bred, you know, as, as having tiger parents and constantly having them bash us for getting a B plus is just a way we were growing up. And, yeah, it, it might be leaning a little bit more that way for sure. Um, I wasn't actually sure based on, obviously this is a day after the election night and uh, sh some crazy shit's going on basically. We have no idea really what's happening around the world. 
But what are your thoughts in terms of everything that's happening right now in the middle of the election? Well, I, I'm happy to say that the media really didn't account for that much, which is so a couple things. The last election four years ago, we sort of learned that celebrity endorsements didn't do anything. Everyone always thought celebrity endorsements were worth something. I think about four years ago, we realized, nah, didn't care. Then didn't move the needle. Like no celebrity endorsed Trump or maybe Kid Rock did. And every one of the big sort of cultural icons, you know, your LeBron James and your Beyonce's and stuff and Oprah, you know, they're all down with Hillary and it didn't seem to move the needle. Well, mm -hmm. this year I've kind of learned that the, you know, New York Times, L.A. Times, CNN, MSNBC, even ABC, CBS, NBC, they all went hard against Trump. They all just went full, full on into bash Trump mode. And I mean, you know, co it, it went from, you know, Russian collusion to to covid to ukraine like it just it was a never-ending um tide of just trump bashing oh and then it then of course went to racist i always love that part i love when everybody i love what i love the notion that everyone who disagrees with you is somehow a racist that that, yeah. that is the that's got to be the most convenient position ever you yeah. disagree with a policy about taxes or borders or uh the green new deal and you thus yeah. de facto you become a racist now you're in the kkk right, right. I, it's it, it's <laughs> insane so it was all racist 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 and then the people voted and you know he got a lot trump got a lot better numbers with my minorities than he did the previous election so it kind of said to me that the the boy who cried racist like people weren't really listening and people people i i've i've been saying this for a long time which is CNN is going to lose its credibility if they just keep bashing Trump, if they just keep going after Trump. People are going to stop listening to them. They have Don't you to. Think it's too late already? Hmm? Yeah, it is. Don't you think it's too late already? It, in some well, ways? well, what we learned from the election is, is yeah, it is too late. If, 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 if Biden had won by a landslide, as CNN predicted, if Biden had won by a landslide, then you would have went, oh, my God, this worked. You know what I mean? But because he didn't, it, it is too late or it is now we found out uh, a day and a half ago. It's too late. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how much you talk about politics and stuff. Like, Obviously, you've been very outspoken in the past. And the thing is, it's a little bit different with Trump, right? We, we had Scott Adams on who claimed that he lost 30 percent of his income and 75 percent of his friends when he vouched that Trump was going to win. And he started talking a little bit about Trump. I think you were the first person that actually made the correct prediction back in 2008 that Trump was going to be able to win, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to put words in your mouth. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's crazy um I, th I think people when when people don't understand who you are you know particularly there's a lot of people that are more independent or nonpartisan. they hate it they, they, they don't they want to be able to label you somewhere and because they can't understand you they call you a racist yeah well i i think the deal is um if you are a Republican, you're thus de facto a racist. So, look, <laughs> they were trying to call Mitt Romney a racist 10 minutes ago. You know, they, they they will call whomever a racist like that's That's how it works. I was talking to somebody the other day and uh, I like uh, Dan Crenshaw from Texas. He's the guy with the eye patch. He's a good dude. And solid as Sears and a Navy SEAL and everything. And I said, I hope that guy runs for president one day. And someone was saying, yeah, 
and he's, you know, he's, his, his background is spotless. He's, he was a Navy SEAL. He was injured in, in country. And, uh, he's just a solid, solid ass dude. And I said, yeah, mm-hmm. that'll be good for a bit. And then we're, we're going to call him a racist. And at some point he'll yep. be called a racist. And I, mm-hmm. I, I wonder, I kind of marvel at the bravado and sort of hubris and, and even intellectual capacity to just sit at your anchor desk and pontificate about people being racist all night. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. it feels insane to me. I would never do that. I would never call somebody a racist. I would, I mean, without, you know, really solid proof that they were a racist. It is in it. It's it's so and the thing is is it's like I was watching some news the other day and some commentator was saying uh, a black woman was like saying well these these Latin people as Cuban people Hispanic people and in Florida they voted for Trump because they hate themselves <laughs> they hate their Hispanic culture or whatever it is it's like yeah, do you realize yeah. how asinine that sounds and also who anointed you some sort of genie that uh, climbs into the heads of hispanic people and 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 yes that's how people vote they vote because they hate themselves it's 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 preposterous and yeah and the thing that's the thing that's insane is how regular people don't say shit about it i i scream about it all the time everyone else just buttons up because they're all mm-hmm. fucking cowards. They're cowards. They won't say a word about it. They're scared shitless. Everyone in Hollywood, this whole town, they're all cowards. They're all down with the Black Lives Matter movement. They they don't even know what it is. They just they they don't want to be wished out into the cornfield. They don't want what happened to Scott Adams. Yeah, I mean, why is this happening? Why why is I mean the cancel culture that exists here today. I mean, I mean you've just gotten this this year alone. I mean, think about how many of the legendary comics and 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 figures have just been vanished. Uh, I think your friend Jimmy Kimmel, of course, had like a close call. And I mean, it just seems like everyone is trying to get everyone canceled. And you know, back in the day, comedians were like the safe, the safest position to be able to call out the truth of what's happening in society without people bashing them. Because of course you can always say, I'm a comedian. This is not meant to be harmful or intentional, uh, intentionally bashing her in any way. That doesn't even exist anymore. I mean, that's just gone with everything that's happening. I mean, how do you feel about that? And how do you navigate around it when you're talking for a living at this point? I just say whatever I want and people leave me alone because they understand I say whatever I want and I don't apologize. You know, I, I put a tweet out, I don't know, March, April, somewhere, whatever, maybe it was May. I don't, I don't remember the calendar anymore, but I put this tweet out that, uh, started trending, which is basically me saying this coronavirus kills old people and it kills um, sick people. And basically all you pussies just got played by the media. (laughs) So, and, and, (laughs) and so what happened was, is, um, I, I got a call. I Judd Apatow called me and he's like, you got to take that down. Oh God. And a bunch of people told me you got to take it down. I never took it down. It's still there. My oh biggest my regret is I didn't spell pussies right. I didn't do I E S. I did Y apostrophe S. But <laughs> yes, but well, well, where are? First off, how true is that statement? It's killing old people and it's killing sick people. It's not killing young, healthy people. And the media played everybody. Yeah. Well, I guess the idea of that is young people can associate with older people because they meet for family dinners or they go to their parents' house or whatever. So it's more the contamination. I get it, but we should have never locked down healthy people. We should have never. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as quarantining healthy people. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when the economy is such 
so fragile with everything that's happening. But yeah, I mean, people are, are sensitive. And I think, you know, this talk about automation of what Andrew Yang and, and the UBI, there, there's some relative to that because I think this is my theory is that before where you would be able to get information from three channels, really. And there's obviously a lot of bad to that because there's a lot of, you know, feeding information there that's not true. But now everyone has a voice and algorithms are more powerful than ever where you look at someone's YouTube feed and you wouldn't believe the shit that comes out of their channel or their Netflix recommended for you just because they're so powerful in terms of understanding what you're going to click on. So when you go to your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed, a lot of the times you're just getting information where you want to believe or it feels good for you. And it's just been this recurring cycle for the last 10 years, 20 years, and the algorithms are just getting more powerful, right? And when nowadays, when, when people are getting this opposing information, even if it's just going to be slightly opposed to what they are used to believing or what they used to click on on Twitter, people go fucking crazy because they're just not used to that because of how social media works today and how the algorithms work today. Right. Yeah. Uh, people are going to really have to learn how to manage information and the, the tidal wave that just sort of comes at them every day. And mm -hmm. there's really on, the only way to manage it is to get out of it. You just have to leave your phone at home and you have to take a hike and you have to go swim in the ocean. You know what I mean? You physically just to, you need to physically remove yourself from it. X amount of X amount of time a week. Otherwise it, it, it will consume you and whatever it is, it's never, it's never a good ending. Even, even if the information seems like good information, you're still processing way too much information. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you deal with that, with, with social media and consumption of all these technologies that you have? I mean, how are you able to balance that? I, I really volitionally stay away from it. Like mm -hmm. somebody, if somebody says to me, and it happens all the time, like someone will send me a tweet and they'll say, uh, here's a link to uh, Jimmy and Howard Stern talking about you on the Howard Stern show. Right. You don't really, I'd be so tempted. I, I'm not. Wow. I, is, I have a weird wiring. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to listen to it. That's, huh. that's, that's how, how I, how I work. I'm not, I'm not better than other people and I'm not perfect and I do have my foibles and I do have things where sometimes I want to snoop around or see, see this or hear that. But by and large, I just steer clear of it because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there's never, it's never a happy ending. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to switch gears a little bit with, with things that are happening in the, uh, when the election, I know, you had a somewhat of a relationship with Trump before he, you know, decided to pursue politics, of course. Um, I think you were in the celebrity celebrity apprentice, right? What what was that like? Paint the picture of like interviewing him at the Playboy Mansion. Is that the first time you met him? Oh God, I don't know. We've we've had we've been guests on the same show before. Um, yeah. spent some time sort of backstage and celebrity apprentice and yeah, I guess playboy mansion, I, I guess I, you know, um, he is who he is. You know, it's kind of interesting. I, I had this thought, uh, the other day. So Trump is just Trump and more Trump. You know, when you meet him in real mm -hmm. life, he's just more Trump than you even think he would be. You know, I, I, ha I had this interesting observation that popped in my head. I was watching uh, some footage of like a rally that uh, Kamala Harris was doing and 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 Hillary Clinton used to do this, too, where they if they get in front of a black church, they change their voice. You know, <laughs> like like Hillary Clinton would 
she becomes Southern, you know, when she gets in front of like a black church and says y'all and, and all that kind of stuff. And Kamala Harris does yeah. that too. And a lot of politicians yeah, yeah. do it, by the way, it's kind of natural. You know what I mean? Like sure. it's, it's just something that people do. Um, yeah. Trump never changes his voice. <laughs> then that's kind of who Trump yeah. is. Right. So think about the person who changes their voice. Right. So Hillary, yeah. Hillary Clinton just kind of wants to be all things to all people, right? Trump wants to be Trump. And you learn so much in the very simple act of not altering your voice. Yeah. So when you alter your voice in front of a group, you're kind of saying, accept me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm one of you. Accept yeah. me. You know what I mean? I mean, there's a version, you know, you go to, you go to Texas A&M and you yell out the name of the Aggies or whatever. And the whole gym starts cheering. It's, it's a natural thing, but think yeah. about Trump's wiring. He does, he does these rallies all over the country. You wouldn't be able to tell by his voice, what group he was in front of. Right. You could tell from Hillary Clinton who, who she was in front of. And it's kind of it's an in, it's an interesting little glimpse into his psyche. By the way, I don't know if it's good or bad. It's just that's that's him. Yeah, I mean the benefit of that is is the idea of it is that you get what you see, and some people like that because of the lack of transparency, I guess, that exists particularly in politics. It was like refreshing side of it, but I think. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's I think people are seeing some of the some of the downsides of that of course based on what's some of the things that are happening in politics and in the in the economy as well. But um I mean I would say a lot of that is how you succeeded in podcasting as well is like you don't have one face versus another face. You are Adam Carolla and you say what's on your mind. You don't really change your tone or how nice you are or or how you treat someone based on who they really are. Obviously, you have some adjustments, but you are you. And I imagine in a format like podcasting where it's just so natural and long form, I imagine that's one of the things that has really helped out in terms of the, the growth of the podcast as well. Something that I'm learning from you as well. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I don't really, you know, my, my take on getting into comedy and being a comedian and just sort of having a voice was I can't alter my voice. I can't, I don't mean literally, although I'm not very good at that either, but what I'm saying <laughs> is, is yeah. <laughs> come on y'all. I was, I was giving you a compliment. Come on. I, I really, uh, uh, I, I think about it and I think why the hell did I get into stand up and why the hell I start a podcast or why write a book if I was going to kind of figure out, you know, I was going to lick my finger and put it up in the wind and just kind of figure out which way the wind was blowing. You know what I mean? Like why, why would I do that? Why, what, what would be attractive about that? You know, it's not a popularity contest. And, but the sad part is, is it, it kind of is a popularity contest. Like you want the most people listening and buying tickets and being a fan of yours. And I say things that drive people away all the time. But sure. in my world, if it happens to be true, then I'm allowed to say it. And a lot of people take umbrage with that. And there's a lot of comedians that are very worried about saying this joke or giving that opinion or, or what have you, because they're scared they're going to lose their livelihood. And my thing is, is what about your dignity? Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. Very well said. Well, I want to be respectful of your time, Adam. Um, really want to thank you for coming on the show and, uh, and of course being who you are. I uh, recommend everyone to check out I'm Your Emotional Support Animal. Uh, very entertaining book. As I mentioned, it's an easy read and it's hilarious. Uh, what else should people be checking out, Adam? 
Uh, you, anyone who wants anything from me, stand up appearances or what have you can go to adamcrolla.com. And if you want to see some free stand up, if you guys aren't getting out or can't go to the clubs or the clubs are closed, you can go to uh, my YouTube page at YouTube. I guess it's YouTube uh, slash Adam Carolla and you can watch stand up. I have stand up sets there all over the place. Nice. So enjoy that. You're publishing content as well now on YouTube, right? Pretty regularly. Yeah. So show. join, join the YouTube page. Yeah. Yeah, highly recommend that. All right, Adam, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you guys for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, Sean.